It's working. It's working. Can we hear you? Well, you know, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here and to introduce to you Professor Santiago Legari, who uh, is a man after my heart because he shares a uh, love of natural law in general and John Finnis's view of natural law in particular. But uh, he pointed out to me that in looking at the sign uh, announcing the event, the description was law and mortality. <laughs> so, and I thought, you know, it really, this is a subject about mortality. And we are, we're all going to die. And we make a lot of choices before we die. And I always bemoan the fact that so few people really worry about what constitutes a good choice. What is full flourishing in a real sense? And ultimately, what does it mean to be a full flourishing human being? You would think that someone who has an opportunity to explore a well thought out system of practical reasonableness, uh, which John Finnis sets out, wouldn't miss the opportunity to see with a rather uh, careful explication of a thousand year, two thousand year old tradition of natural law reasoning offers by way of guidance about how to make choices of the good and how to act consistent with your nature as a free, rational, and social being. You know what I always like to point out to students that John Finnis in his book describes the seven basic goods as an exhaustive theory of the goods, life, knowledge, friendship, play, beauty, practical reason, religion, probably miss one there, the, and knowledge. Uh, final ends for human beings. Every decision should be considered in the light of the importance of promoting those particular goods, because the general proposition of natural law is the good is to be done and promoted, and it's contrary evil to be avoided. So when we talk about natural law, we talk about how to achieve the good, and Finnis gives us nine principles of practical reasons. Uh, and I just am amazed at how uh, very few have developed the kind of enthusiasm that Ligaria and I, uh, that Santiago and I have. And my hope is always that there'll be some groundswell <laughs> uh, of enthusiasm among law students who, and to some extent there is, when students get exposed to this uh, very deep and complex material, which comes under a, an umbrella of rather simple, direct, notions of the good and what's reasonable, there are some who go on to uh, build a life around using these fundamental principles of natural law. So without further, I just wanted to uh, tell you that uh, Santiago is a professor at the University of Argentina, the Catholic University of Argentina, uh, and has a very close connection with Notre Dame, where he had, teaches regularly as a visiting professor, jurisprudence uh, and law and morality. And he's a very close associate of John Finnis. So uh, when he speaks today, he speaks with uh, a great deal of authority, having written a number of articles about John Finnis. And today his, his topic uh, is the practical topic of using objective principles of morality natural law principles in the interpretation of the Constitution. So without any further, Professor Ligari. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that very kind introduction. And thank you to all of you for your presence here today. Um, I'm pleased to have not only distinguished students in the audience, but also distinguished scholars, Lonergan scholars, as I was told. Um, a professor, William Hartnett, whose work I had studied in Argentina, and now I come to meet him more or less by chance here, which is also great. A former dean, uh, Father Dick. So I, it's, a, it's a privilege, really. Um, it's also quite amazing how the devotion, so to speak, for an author 
can unite two persons, in this case, Michael Ambrosio and I, you may think that we are, we've been friends like all our lives, and if I tell you that I'm staying at his house, you may think it even more so. But let me tell you the truth of the matter. Uh, before yesterday, I had seen him 40 minutes once a year ago when uh, we had a quick breakfast as a result of my telling John Coverdale, a former colleague of some of yours, that I had written something on Finnis, and John Coverdale said, I have a colleague who is like a total fan of Finnis. You should meet him. So 24 hours later, I was having breakfast with Michael a year ago, and, and now I'm here. So it's, it's quite crazy if you think of it. Um, I was telling jokingly my friends at Notre Dame or Notre Dame, as he would say, which I prefer, but if you say Notre Dame in Notre Dame, they don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, let me just make a small digression. I don't know if you are aware of the circumstance that at the University of Our Lady in South Bend, Indiana, there is a grotto where students go to pray, and you know, if you look at it, it's exactly identical to the one in southern France, in Lourdes. And my first time there, exactly 20 years ago, I was uh, praying, and next to me there was the father of a freshman student who was giving his son some advice and telling him that he should come to the grotto to pray because this is such an important apparition of Our Lady that in France they did a similar thing. <laughs> so you can imagine that Notre Dame doesn't fly there. Um, so I was telling some friends, I'm, I'm staying at the house of this professor of Seton Hall Law School and they said, okay, so you've known him for years. And I said, no, actually I met him for 40 minutes. And they were looking at me, you know, maybe he's going to kidnap you or <laughs> something like that. You know, I'm quite fine though. Uh, it's funny that he would say, now getting into the topic, that uh, you know we're not in church here. When he was joking about people sitting in the back, because I think that one of the main sources of confusion regarding the topic of natural law is precisely to think that this is all about church. Catholic doctrine, the catechism, which I find quite ironic, not only because the likes of Plato or Aristotle or Cicero were the founders of natural law thought and they were pre-Christian, of course, but also because even in our days, when I have to teach my students natural law, and most of my students are far from being practicing Catholics, what I tell them, and I think there is some truth to this, is that natural law is like the religion of the atheist. So in a way, it's more or less the opposite of what most people think it is, in that the appeal of natural law is certainly always one that doesn't include faith in the premises of reasoning, but rather reason alone. Another problem with natural law, especially in this country, is the politicization of the problem, um, the divisive politics that sometimes surrounds natural law. So someone was telling me earlier, actually it was your dean, come think of it, when I was introduced to her a few minutes ago, she, she wasn't paying attention to me, she was looking at my tie. Now I don't know if you can see from there, but these are elephants. And the elephants are here because this tie, I got it in Africa, where I go every year to teach a short course during my vacation. But it seems to be that elephants have other meanings <laughs> in, in this part of the world. Well, I, I know they do, but I, I couldn't care less. I just like the elephants. And uh, it's so unfortunate that that natural law theory seems to have been appropriated by elephants, or I don't know, by some party or other here so that 
you seem to have to be on one side or on the other side of a political debate when indeed uh, natural law is a clearly non-partisan concept and as it happens, uh, always you will have people on one side and on the other side that will or will not engage in this kind of reasoning. A worry that Michael was sharing with me is the worry that as a result of these confusions and others, natural law is not being sufficiently taught in US law schools, including in Catholic law schools such as this one or Notre Dame. So let me give you the example of Notre Dame. There, you have a required course in jurisprudence that you need to take either in your second or your third year. There is presently controversy regarding that and there's some pressure to remove the requirement altogether. But for now, it's there. And the way natural law features most times, Professor Finnis does not teach this course, is uh, not different from the way it features or it featured in, in the jurisprudence textbooks that, uh, typically in America and in England where you have a panoramic view of some seven or eight so-called schools of thought where natural law typically features at the beginning to be then superseded by some improved versions of the philosophy of law that compete with natural law as if natural law were just that, you know, a school and not a reality. And then, of course, when you come to the ninth, the students completely forgot about what was there first. And in a course that has maybe 15 weeks, you spend one week doing natural law. So typically, you won't read the dialogues of Plato. You won't read bits of the Nicomachean ethics or the politics. You won't read Cicero. You won't read the Stoics. You won't read Augustine. You won't read Aquinas. You won't read the rationalistic natural law thinkers of the 17th century or Kant or, or etc. I mean, they give you like a bit of John Finnis and you don't understand a word of it because you don't have Michael Ambrosio to explain to you. So I find this unfortunate. In my university, for example, we have uh, two required courses in jurisprudence. One of them, appropriately in my view, is in first year. The law degree, by the way, there is an undergraduate degree, which may make a difference for uh, us having two courses on this, as ours is a five-year undergraduate degree. So we have one in first year, one in fourth year. <coughs> and then you have other schools in different other um, elective courses or courses that are required but are not uh, on natural law exclusively. So with that introduction, let me say a few words about natural law itself before I get into the implications of natural law for the interpretation of the Constitution, not only the US Constitution, but any Constitution. I'll, I'll do this with the caveat that um, I, there is an article I sent Michael which you can all feel very welcome to request from him in case you'd like to read the longer version of the argument. I asked him last night, should I be short and, and provocative and imprecise or should I read a paper? He said, don't read a paper. So, um, and then we'll have time for questions if there are any, if we do what we're going to do. So first, natural law is a type of normativity, a type of guidance, but it's a peculiar one in that I want to say it's invisible. So this natural law has in common with angels, for example. You cannot prove the existence of natural law in a lab. And this, of course, poses a problem for the radical skeptic. The radical skeptic, 
a version of which is some types of positivism, will certainly find a problem with the natural law argument because he will say, show me the facts in a way where this invisible normativity doesn't count as a fact. Instead, if I throw this into the air, which I won't, this will fall, you know, and this will count as a fact to prove the law of gravity. That I cannot do with natural law. I can claim that natural law is not only about morality, but also about mortality. But, you know, you'll need to die and see what happens later to check that I'm right or I'm not, and maybe I'll be dead by then. So it doesn't, it doesn't work for scientific purposes if you define science uh, in a way that chemistry or physics or biology only qualify for that. The ancients, they had, of course, no problem with admitting this invisible normativity. Uh, some of them did not call it natural law. Famously, Sophocles in his play uh, Antigone, with which I start all my natural law courses, never uses the term natural law or natural right, but, but this invisible normativity is clearly at stake in the interaction between uncle and niece, Creon and Antigone. It's a, Antigone, it's a fantastic uh, play to illustrate the moral point of view and the legal point of view, how Antigone is acting perhaps wrongly from the legal point of view or perhaps rightly from the moral point of view. Um, then in Plato and later in Aristotle, the term natural right and later more clearly in the Middle Ages, natural law emerge. Uh, the expression objective critical morality describes pretty well what this is about. Morality to describe natural law, morality is a term that comes into the vocabulary much later with this use. So for example, uh, McIntyre would argue that only uh, from the 18th century onwards, morality is used like this and not in the works of the classics. Um, objective critical, I think, uh, oh, by the way, here comes the dean. Very welcome. <laughs> I had just quoted our conversation about the tie. It was very useful, I thought. <laughs> Don't start over on my account. No problem, no problem. So objective critical, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's neat because objective, it tells you that this is not just about what I think and what you think, but there is something that transcends our preferences, our opinions. And critical, what it's telling you is that there are criteria of fairness that are not exclusively conventional, that there is a type of justice that does not result exclusively from what we agree on or from what a legislator decides, which this would be contract and enacted law, the two main sources of positive law. They are not all that it is according to this view where convention is relevant, but it's, it's not everything. There, is, there are some things that are right, that are just, the typical term would be according to nature, independently of convention or positive law. The rise of empiricism, especially in the 19th century, contributed to the decadence of the study of natural law in a very unfortunate way, which was what uh, Professor Finnis found when he started studying the, the field in the early 60s when he came from Australia to Oxford. This is reflected in the preface to his 1980 book, Natural Law, Natural Rights, where he says that for him, when he started studying, natural law was the domain of superstition, Mm, dark theories associated with darker times and only he only after a process of some sort of intellectual journey and conversion 
you know, going objectively through the materials, he came to realize that this, this was not necessarily so. And uh, you could say he is like the father of a renaissance of the study of natural law, especially in the English-speaking world, although I want to joke that for an English-speaking person, that's the world full stop. And therefore, if you, if you ask someone, and I don't know, it's in some parts of the English-speaking world, they would tell you that, of course, John Finnis is the natural law scholar in the world. But then the problem is the definition of the world. Um, interestingly, in his work and in his book, this is very ironic, I find. He totally dropped the term natural law. So that his main book is titled Natural Law and Natural Rights. But then you try to find the word natural law in the book, and you will find that the references to what that is come with other names, with other labels. I think he, he did this on purpose precisely because he was fearing that if he would use the term natural law, some people would just drop the book instantly. But then sometime after he started his work, there was a, a student at the University of Notre Dame who wrote a doctoral dissertation in the late 80s titled the New Natural Law Theory. Now, this person, a Professor Russell Hittinger, he is the one who actually revived the use of the term, of the label, natural law, adding the adjective new to refer to what Finnis was doing and then to what some of his students were doing, such as, for example, Princeton Professor Robert P. George the new natural lawyers, says um, Hittinger. Hittinger, he uses the label uh, in a pejorative way to criticize them because he thinks that, that Finnis and others are actually not developing the tradition but betraying the tradition. But that doesn't really matter for the purposes of my talk today. What matters is that now, in 2017, the term uh, new natural law is, is used, I would say, um, um, vastly to refer to, to these people with a, with a meaning that is pretty neutral. So if you use today the term new natural law, they'll know that what you're referring to is to this revival of natural law in the English-speaking world, headed basically by Finnis and then seconded by some of his students and disciples. I think that there are uh, three ways in which this natural law, this invisible normativity, can come into play with regard to positive law, with regard to law school, and in particular with regard to constitutional law and the interpretation of the Constitution. Briefly, the first of these three is to affirm that natural law is relevant for you, for each one of you, individually. So when you need to decide whether you're going to lie or not to your spouse, or whether you're going to commit fraud as an academic or as, a, or as someone who pays tax or whatever, natural law provides you with guidance and uh, sheds some light on your conscience, which will help you reach a sound decision, uh, one that will make you, as Michael said earlier, flourish as a person, and one that, if you do not heed, will make you not to flourish as a person. And then, if you're a believer, after mortality, this will be relevant too. So I, I want to say that if you just cut it there, I want to call this version an individualistic version of natural law, insofar as, according to this version, natural law has nothing to say about social life. So what is right or wrong for you may be not the same as what is right or wrong for her 
and for him and for that group and so on. I mean, I'm no one to say anything about other people's conduct. Notice that this position is more or less the opposite of the liberal position made famous by John Stuart Mill, but embraced subsequently by so many others, where there the idea is that when it comes to what Mill calls self-regarding conduct, there is no right or wrong. There is only what he calls prudence, by which he doesn't mean what Aristotle or Aquinas mean by prudence, but rather self-interest, rather expediency. So a prudent person in Mill's sense is a, a very astute person who knows how to handle his affairs in a way that will benefit himself or herself. <coughs> so for Mill, morality uh, is, has zero relevance in that domain. Morality only comes into play when I interact with others. And what controls there, as you know, is the harm principle. Instead, for this first version of natural law, there is a self-regarding morality, and it's controlled invisibly and in a non-inexorable way by natural law. Non-inexorable in the sense that you're always free not to heed this sort of metaphorical whisper that will tell you, do not uh, lie to your spouse, for example. This is the first uh, way in which natural law can come into play. A second way is one that uh, denies that the relevance of morality is restricted to the individual and affirms with the classics that what is good for me is good for you <coughs> and what is bad for me is bad for you. Then, of course, circumstances may vary enormously, but especially when it comes to certain types of conduct that are always wrong, that are always wrong from, for anyone, and, and this is the idea that the, there is a unity to the moral order. It's not that there is like a, a, a block where this is just you, and then there are like several views <coughs> and individuals that do not communicate. This is the idea of a certain cont continuity of the moral order. But according to, to some who, who agree with this view, this continuity, when it comes to the public sphere, should only be relevant when it comes to, to law and to politics for the legislator. So the legislator, Congress, the state legislature, whatever, uh, ought to take into consideration what is really right and what is really wrong for my community, which is the same as what is really right and wrong for me, as I said earlier. For the legislator, this is a, this is a moral duty. But once the legislator has chosen what to do with any given moral principle that bears connection with the subject matter, the legislator is about to touch upon, then that's it. That's the end of the relevance of natural law. In other words, a judge or a justice of the Supreme Court, when, when, when he or she faces a, a piece of legislation for this judge or for this justice, natural law is completely irrelevant. It has no traction whatsoever. Natural law has traction for me, as an individual, natural law has traction for me as a legislator, but the judge, uh, for the judge, the law is a, an exclusively technical thing. Um, you could say, you could call this a positivist view, in a way, that uh, restricts the relevance of natural law to the individual sphere and the, to the pre-legislative sphere. A typical example of this view in the United States, I think, is the view of Justice Scalia, who, as far as I know, um, would be very happy to 
agree that, that there is uh, an objective critical morality, that there are some things that are right, that are wrong, and this is, ought to be taken into consideration by the legislator, but once it's in there, if I want to know what to do as an interpreter, I ought to, for example, check what the meaning was of the word persons in the 14th Amendment at the time that that amendment was ratified. In other words, his version of originalism. And that's what controls. That's the beginning of the inquiry. That's the end of the inquiry. If persons means whatever it means, then that's it. That's what I ought to do. Then if someone wants to change the law, they change the law. I cannot do it, is the idea, as a justice. Then there is the third uh, and final way in which I, natural law can come into play with regard to constitutional interpretation, the one I find more persuasive. This one, like the second one, also affirms that the relevance of natural law is not only for uh, individual morality, but also for uh, the morality of a society and of any group, so the same idea of continuity, but doesn't restrict the relevance of natural law to the pre-legislative stage. Rather, it affirms that natural law is relevant to, for interpretation and adjudication, which is in the hands of a judiciary. But it, it does it with a distinction. And with this distinction, I'll start to wrap up, and then we can move to the Q&A. And I would be happy to take questions if there are any. The distinction is one that was more clearly um, introduced by Thomas Aquinas, and that still makes total sense today to me. And it's between aspects of law, and now I'm talking about in particular about the Constitution, but this is true in general about positive law, aspects that have a closer connection to the permanent principles of morality or natural law, and aspects that have a more remote connection. The first he calls, Aquinas calls, uh, human laws that are derived, that's the verb he uses, from natural law by way of conclusion, he says. I go into this into more detail in the paper. And the second one, he calls derivation by way of determination. So the thesis is that whenever <coughs> there is a just legal enactment, that legal enactment is connected to natural law either by way of conclusion or by way of determination. Most of the law is connected to natural law by way of determination, so I'll start with that. What is meant by that is that when the legislator derives by way of determination, the legislator picks a certain human good that wants to promote through legislation, and that human good can be promoted for this particular problem of coordination at stake in many several ways. It requires a, cer a certain determination. So take, for example, the general principle, the general moral principle, natural law principle, that the goods of someone who goes bankrupt ought to be distributed in a fair way among the creditors of this person or of this company. Now, this is a general fundamental principle of morality of natural law. But this principle is compatible when it comes to legislating bankruptcy with many different possible determinations that may instantiate legitimately the general principle. There is no one uniquely right um, determination of the general principle. Instead, when it comes to some moral principles and their connection with our law, say the typical example is the law of murder, the connection is more straightforward. You pick uh, the law of murder insofar as it makes the moral crime of murder a legal crime, a criminal offense in, a, in the state of New Jersey, and then 
you compare the moral precept with the legal precept, and there is a huge overlap. It's not that there is so much determination. I mean, there'll be determination when it comes to what the sanction will be for the crime, whether there'll be a jury. Those are indeed derivations by way of determination, but the chunk of the, of the crime is, is exactly the same. The legal crime, what it does is to ratify a pre-existing moral crime. The same is true with parts of criminal law. The same is true with parts of family law. The same is true with parts of human rights law. What is it to be equal? What is the right to life? What is it to have freedom of expression? I mean, all these will need some determination. But essentially, the core of the positive law will mimic, if you want, a pre-existing moral precept, which is not true for the vast majority of the law. With regard to the vast majority of the law, the legislator has uh, a great power of creativity. So what I want to say is that the relevance of natural law is greater when it comes to interpret those bits of criminal, family, constitutional law that are more directly related. And then when you're talking about uh, more technical matters, of which there are tons, of course, in the law, then the technical dimension of the law is at its, at, at its highest. But there will still always be a connection with some moral principle. Unless, of course, this is an unjust law, which leads me to my final consideration. And I'm glad that it is the final consideration, not only because we'll be done, but also because typically when people talk about natural law, they start with this instead of finishing with this. They think many times that, OK, what is natural law about? Well, natural law is about unjust laws and the idea that unjust laws are not laws. This is so sad because mainly natural law is something that is like the body of that dress called positive law. So wherever there is a fair positive legal system, there is natural law in there. It's like the legal system is the can, but inside the can there is some liquid. Now the case of unjust laws is where the can has poison inside so that if you drink it, you'll die. And again, natural law is relevant regarding unjust laws, not so much to interpret them, but to allow you to criticize them. And then depending on the legal system, we were talking about this earlier with Professor Hardnett, uh, if you're a judge, you know, sometimes you'll say, well, this is a disaster, but it's not for me to, to change it. Or sometimes you'll say, I'm not applying this law, impeach me. So the, the relevance varies, it depends on the gravity of the injustice of a law. Thomas Aquinas makes uh, several interesting distinctions. You know, sometimes fairness requires you to abide by an unjust law to avoid a greater evils. And sometimes mm, this would not be a solution compatible with acting morally, not even by a judge. Thank you so much. Yes, thank yeah, you. So, uh, thanks, this is really interesting. And I have, a, from, my, from my philosophical theology training and legal training, kind of a meta, meta uh, question critique and drilling into the constitutional question. So I, I'm sort of on the hinder side of the ledger here. Um, it seems to me like the new natural law, as Hittinger defines it, does sort of want to set metaphysics aside but smuggles in a metaphysic anyway, and you know certainly the you know the Greeks had a metaphysic, and clearly the classical Christian thinkers, Augustine and Aquinas, had had a metaphysic, uh, and so I just have trouble seeing how you come up with these principles, even of what reason is, without a met metaphysic to embed it in, um, and then I guess that relates to drilling down into the constitutional interpretation because. You know, the, the classic example, of course, is Lochner. And so it, it seems like you have to have a metaphysic of what's going on in that case and what the relationships are to even decide what supposed natural law principles you'd apply in a circumstance like that. So I, I wonder how you would respond to that. Thank you. So uh, just to give some context for those of you who do not have his expertise, uh, Professor Hittinger, his accusation to the new natural lawyers 
is that while Aristotle and Aquinas would use as a starting point of all natural law reasoning a knowledge of the nature of human nature from which they would derive what ought to be the new natural law theory which according to him doesn't do this is betraying that tradition uh, Hittinger would say I, I think I hope I'm fair to him and correct me if I'm wrong, that the reason for the new natural law theorists to do what he says they do is to avoid the so-called naturalistic fallacy, which consists of deriving an ought from an is, and which is famously and partly incorrectly attributed to David Hume. So if you read McIntyre, for example, after Virtue, you'll see there that he thinks that it's crucial, as I read him, to understand human nature in order to know what is that we ought to do. I think that uh, with regard to Hittinger's criticism, I think that there might be a way out of this, which I don't know that would satisfy him or you. And that is to distinguish, I'll put it very simply here, uh, between knowing what I ought to do and knowing why I ought to do it. So if I want to have an answer to the most fundamental questions about the why morality, and why is this, this so or so, why I ought to do this or that, I agree, we need to dive deep into metaphysical and sometimes even theological terrain. The foundations of natural law theory are metaphysical foundations. But uh, for me to know whether it would be right or wrong for me to start lying to you now without you knowing it and start telling you falsities about my life uh, so that at the end of this meeting you will give me a thousand dollars because you are compassionate, etc. I don't need to, to go there, to go to those foundations. So the idea is that at the level of practical reasoning, reasoning for action, you don't ordinarily need to go all the way into knowing what some would call the is question. I don't know if this helps or makes any sense. Well, I understand it. It just still seems to hang in midair. I mean, it, because it feels like you could very practically decide it would be very beneficial to you to uh, deceive me into giving you the thousand dollars. And if you don't have a reason, if you don't have a, a, a broader metaphysic that tells you, no, I shouldn't, um, it seems to me to hang in midair. I, I think that these are different things. Um, it could be beneficial for me to do what I know that I shouldn't do. I'm only saying that I can know that I shouldn't do it without doing any metaphysics. I, that's totally clear to me. Then I can still do it. I'm not convinced you can do epistemology without metaphysics. Yeah, I, I can. I, I mean, I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, Bernard Lonergan. Yeah, no, my name's not Lonergan. I know. Uh, I think he's dead. Well, on page 11, you use the word metaethical. Yeah. And then talk about the fact that there are no substantive moral claims in a metaethical theory are irrelevant. Could you explain a little more what you, why you say that? Yeah. Um, uh, what I mean is that there are two levels of engagement in natural law reasoning. One that stops 
when the contents start, and that I call a meta-ethical approach, in that it doesn't give you a substantial ethical view about you know right or wrong applied to different conducts, but it just tells you, it just affirms what is denied by many, namely that you can know that some things are right and that some things are wrong, that you can be right and wrong about those things, and that if you and I have a discussion about some uh, moral problem, um, one of us <coughs> may be right and the other one may be wrong. So that's what I mean about the first meta-ethical level. So a relativist, for example, would make no sense of this idea that if you and I uh, disagree on whether it would be right or wrong for me to destroy this room, the, the relativist would say, well, here you have two preferences. One prefers to do it, the other one prefers not to, then there are damages and whatnot, but it's not a moral thing. So, so you can agree uh, versus a skeptic versus a relativist that the human mind has this ability and just stop there or go further and uh, say also, as I say myself, that the human mind can also identify what is truly, truly right and truly wrong. Although, of course, subject to mistakes, but then mistake is part of the theory because if I'm going to hold something mistaken, it's from a certain substantive point of view. So that it's similar to David's question then, you still also need some epistemology or some, how, do you have any thought about how the human mind knows in that circumstance? What, what mechanism does it go through to know uh, the right from the wrong? Yes, I, I totally do have an epistemology, and I'm happy that you asked the question so I can try to clarify the previous question too. Um, the way is similar, but not equal, to the way uh, the mind reasons when it comes to theoretical issues. The way it, 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 it reasons theoretically, not with a view to action, but just to know about things, is through reasonings, syllogisms, that in the end, they rely on some self-evident propositions that cannot be proved and that need not be proved. What um, in the Middle Ages used to be called per se nota, propositions or self-evident propositions such as the principle of non-contradiction or the whole is larger than the parts. This at the speculative or theoretical level, but then the same uh, human intelligence or reason can also um, reason with a view to acting and when it does so, it also, I think, uh, relies ultimately in some fundamental underived uh, principles such as first of all that good ought to be pursued and done and evil ought to be avoided and then uh, as Aquinas would say as a result of a reflection on what he calls the natural inclinations of human persons you can fill good and evil uh, with content, which is where we come to the, to the ethical part. Of course, as you go farther from the first principles, the possibility of mistake and the difficulty in, in reaching an answer that will actually make the person flourish is, is much greater. Yes? I want to push you a little bit on your, on your judge. I certainly accept the idea that there are, are some things that judges can't do. That is, that at some point the judge may reach the point of the public.
positive law calls on me to do X, I cannot in good conscience do X, I think the right answer to there is either resign or recuse, not to, not to do it anyway and, and, and be impeached, but that, I, I, that's not what I want to get you focused on. But, but instead, I ask you to focus on which I think is related to it, because it seems to me that the question of whether a judge is empowered to act on his or her own, her own view as a judge, his or her own view of the of natural law as a judge, is a question of positive law. And one can imagine a positive law regime in which judges are so empowered. One can imagine a positive law regime in which judges are not so empowered. I tend to think our regime is better understood as one in which judges are not so empowered for very good democratic and historical reasons. But it seems to me that's not a question of morality. That's not a question of natural law. That's a question of what powers do the positive law give to people holding that office. Thank you, Professor Hardin. I disagree. I think that although the law can do that, can ban the use of natural law by judges in an explicit or an implicit way, I don't think that that is the last word about the matter. Precisely that is what natural law theory is about. I mean, indeed, positive law can do it, but it can be irrelevant. Because my point is that the judge ought to do it regardless of what the positive law says. But bear in mind that a fundamental principle of natural law is the respect of positive law, including a positive law that says something along those lines if it's reasonable. So when I say that natural law has some traction when it comes to the interpretation of positive law as a moral, as a natural law claim, as a universal claim, regardless of what your legal system says, what I'm saying is it's not natural law jurisprudence. It's not Lochner. It's not, you know, do without positive law to install what you consider natural law. Not at all. It's a very delicate, very respectful process where normally there will be a great harmony with the positive law. And what I'm saying is that in order to understand better just positive law, and most positive laws are just, you will need to understand what is the human good that this law is ultimately promoting. That's all I mean by natural law having traction when it comes to the interpretation of positive law. I guess I heard you going further. That is to suggest that in case of ultimate conflict, that the right answer is to act in your official duty in compliance with your view of natural law in the teeth of what positive law otherwise falls on you. Yes, thank you. Yes, I did go further, but I went further pointing out that this is a very exceptional scenario. And I said that unfortunately so many times people want to present it as the main application of natural law. This is something that, I mean, should happen maybe in Hitler's Germany. You know, normally the relevance of natural law will be intrasystemic to optimize the interpretation of a given legal system. And then I also said when we are in the pathology, when I went further, I didn't give an answer. I said that it will depend on how grave is the injustice of the law. And if you ask me, I would say that when it comes to 98 percent of unjust laws, I would agree with you that one ought to apply them and vote for someone who will change the law and put one that is aligned with what is really fair. But then I also think 
that there are exceptional cases in which a judge perhaps ought to run the risk of being impeached as a result of not applying the law. But then he will be saying, this is the law. It's so unjust that I'm not being an accomplice of this. It can happen. It's exceptional. So now, for example, one of my colleagues and friends at Notre Dame has been appointed to the Court of Appeals, the Seventh Circuit, Professor Amy Barrett, or now Judge Amy Barrett. And with regard to the death penalty, when she wasn't a judge, she expressed the view that she would recuse herself. She wouldn't run this risk of being impeached. So I mean, I totally sympathize with distinctions of this sort. It depends on circumstances. Well, thank you so much, Professor. I want to say how much it's a joy to my heart to hear someone as articulate as you to discuss these principles and their implications. So often in law school, the talks that I've heard don't really go to the core question. How should we act? What should we do? And that's what I think you're suggesting here. There's a subtle question at times that demands that we apply the principles of natural law, however difficult it may be. But as you point out, this distinction between a healthy legal system, which most of the laws, 99% of the laws, are morally acceptable, is not the place where we're going to find the use of natural law principles. But certainly, you give Nazi Germany as the example. But there's that circumstance where the natural law creates a duty to revolt when the system as a whole is unjust. And I think that's the point at which we have to be careful to distinguish. A constitution is not a suicide pact. So fundamentally, if the threat to the society is so great because of the immorality of the law that's being applied by the legislature and enforced by an executive, it gets to some point where it destroys the common good or the potential for human flourishing, then the natural law principles have to be applied both by the judiciaries and by individuals in a response to how they should act in the face of a crisis for the common good. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much.